Hello and welcome to the original, the only podcast of its kind for the Quantum Grammar Shoot, a podcast that talks about the grammar technology known as Correct Sentence Structure Communication Parsing Syntax Grammar, i.e. Quantum Grammar, and how it relates to everyday life and current events. And I am your host, Colin Jason Knife and Matthew Colin Glass. This is a podcast of opinion where I share my thoughts on a psychological level of how one would use this technology navigating through everyday now space and other related subjects. Hope you enjoy. To continue on the same line as my past few podcasts and also videos on my YouTube channel. I'm going to be talking, touching on authoritarianism, correctness, um, also autonomy, and the fiction term term empathy. Um, What I'd like to do is to kind of freeform on these things in a sense that When one individual, namely myself, is navigating through the now space, through the continuum, uh, how we use these tools, these conditions of state to navigate, how to recognize things, recognize them not only outside of ourselves, but inside ourselves. You know, the saying, as above, so below, as within, as without, I think these terms, for myself, I think these terms are very ambiguous. As G.I. Gurdjieff once taught, that if you want to know about the universe, if you want to know about the cosmos, study yourself. Because it's the same thing. If you want to know about yourself, study the universe and how planets react with one another and things like that. Now, I'm not going to go into what are planets. Is there space? That type of thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the theology, the knowledge that's out there that in ancient writings about the concept of how planetary influences happen, how solar flares and things like that affect things. Astrology charts. Now, I can't certify how this knowledge works. I don't know enough about it. But what I do know is I've seen evidence that there's something to it. Whether planets exist or not, the way we're taught in school, I don't know. But what I do know, that the sky works as a clock sort of a, to know when the, what position of the now space that you're in. And they also affect moods and things like that. And also, I mean, the, the, the biggest certification of that would be the moon with regards to the tides and with regards to menstrual cycles. So there is something to it, right? And I'm okay with not knowing. And, and gradually learning these things. But what I'm saying that Gurdjieff was saying was that his knowledge, he did know about that stuff. And so his suggestion makes sense to me. So while we're going around looking at others and perhaps judging them, judging their character, how they act, we must also be mindful of ourselves. Because we're basically looking in mirrors most of the time. And to be aware of those types of things. For example, when this was the inspiration for for me doing this podcast or talking about this, was a video that I saw uh, from an individual who claims to be a federal postal judge. And in that video, he was speaking with another person who claims to be a federal postal judge. And 
Well, first of all, for the entire length of the video, not one sentence was uttered that talked about grammar mechanics of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Yet they claimed to be federal postal judges, right? The title of the video had something to do with how to destroy the effects of narcissists, psychopaths, and whatever they were talking about. Now in the video, although neither one of them is a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a doctor, or have, as far as I know, any type of study in these areas, they talk as though they are experts in the area of psychopathy, uh, sociopaths, and narcissism. But they talk about clues that one can have that someone is a narcissist, psychopath, or sociopath in that they have no empathy. The individual has no empathy. And they have an ego. And they perhaps can be kind of cruel about things. And the dichotomy of this is they're talking about this as though they themselves are very considerate, kind, and they have empathy. And they have little to no ego. And yet at the end of the video, they tell a story about an individual whom they confronted in a public place, intimidated, supposedly made shake, physically shake out of fear. And they laughed about it. They laughed for a good five minutes, just laughing, telling the story about how they scared this individual because perhaps they designated and categorized this individual as a psychopath, a narcissist, or a sociopath. So perhaps in their mind, they thought it was okay to not exercise empathy and to bully this individual because they had designated them as a certain type of individual. The psychology of this is quite disturbing. It's sort of like what I've learned about like how the military will program the soldiers in time of war to think of the enemy as less than human. That it's okay to kill, you know, children or entire families because those children are going to grow up to be the enemy. So might as well get it now, get them out of the way. And it's also the way that society is divided. How one side somehow makes the other side seem less than human. When we talk about those who are jabbed and who are not jabbed, both sides use this tactic into designating the other side as somehow less than human or somehow not worthy of quote unquote rights. This is a psychopathic tactic. This is the use of fear. And this is what I've been talking about, authoritarian system. The individuals who claim to be federal postal judges, they used these tactics, these fiction tactics of fear and intimidation to be able to be cruel to someone simply because they have designated the person as some sort of subspecies. So it's okay to be cruel to them now because they're not like us. They're some sort of subspecies. I find personally this, I find it very disturbing. The psychology of this. And on a side note, looking at the comments field, the live chat, I saw people in that live chat who actually come onto my grammar channel I saw them in that comments field and now I understand better why these individuals have never learned correct sentence structure, have trouble learning it, and just have huge challenges because they participate with this fiction bullshit perpetrated by these quote unquote federal postal judges. Not grammar knowledge, they never promote grammar knowledge but they promote this type of psychology, this quasi pseudo psychology on their channel, which I mean, there's no, there's nothing really 
to be said about just giving your opinion about things. This is a podcast of opinion. You can take it or leave it. These individuals, these commenters who join my feeds and then also join these individuals' feeds, we're in there talking about Bible quotes, about reptilian, draconian, lizard, alien, whatever's, talking about just really out there stuff. And other people were joining in talking about this as if it's, this is stuff that, that is going to help them in the quote-unquote real world in a practical sense. What I'm trying to say is the fiction, BS, perpetrated by these two quote-unquote federal postal judges is being ate up like candy by these people in the comments fields, some of whom also join in on my grammar channel. I can only hope, you know, for myself personally, that these individuals who go between these two vessels that somehow the grammar catches them, catches their attention in some way, and they move away from that fiction, that stuff that's uncertifiable, the stuff that's out there that can never be verified by any practical means. It's all assumption presumption. And by doing so, by coming into learning the grammar, then one can use a correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar lens with which to perceive things and they begin to see that oh that violates rule one rule equal that violates the geometric level playing field of contract when an individual goes in and bullies someone who takes pleasure and finds humor in humiliating and causing another human being another man or woman to be afraid so much so that they physically shake out of fear. Yeah, ha ha, that's funny. I find that disturbing. And I also find that it really speaks to the character of the individual telling the story. What they really feel and what they really think. So in these videos that I look at with these two individuals, I can pretty much guess that all of the things that they warn against, all of the things that they describe. As I said earlier, when we walk around, we're looking at mirrors of ourselves psychologically. I'd have to say that these individuals are basically projecting themselves onto the people they're criticizing or, or demoralizing or subverting. They're projecting their true natures. That's a guess. I don't know for sure. I'm not a psychologist but I am a logician and I follow the logic. And this is a logical conclusion based upon the evidence, none of which has anything to do with correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. This can be carried on into other areas of the correct sentence structure, or I'll say the quantum grammar contingent, in that there are elements of this contingent that try to divide the community, and I use that word loosely, whereas some people are correct and some people are not correct. If you follow A, B, and C, if you have so-and-so's thumbprint on your live life claim, then you are correct. Just by virtue of having this individual's thumbprint and autograph on your live life claim, even though they've never met you, never witnessed you, never saw you, they're still going to witness your live life claim. And so you're correct now. Whether you know the grammar or not, you're correct. And then there's the other people who are thieves and liars and pieces of shit and narcissists and psychopaths and sociopaths because they don't have the thumbprint in the autograph on their live life claim. 
You see what I'm saying here? These are fiction tactics. Divide and conquer. And by conquer, I mean conquer because these individuals are warlike. Of course, even though they've never been in the military, they do have that volition to be violent, to be bullies. And you just watch any of the videos and you will see that. They were that way in the past and they're that way now. And these are things, these are tactics that the fiction uses. That's why I said long ago that I feel like those contingencies have moved into the fiction completely. That there's no longer, has anything to do with rule one, rule equal. It's all about rule one, rule do what I say. Rule one, rule kiss my ass and you can be free. Where have you heard that before? Uh, it's, not, it's not hard to see if you use logic. I'm a big proponent of the trivia method, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. A good study of that will be a very good prep for learning correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar. There's no doubt about it. It will also help to see through some of these facades and also to be aware of them within oneself. Because there's a little, as, as I said, I, I feel like when one navigates through the now space, one is basically seeing reflections of different parts of one's personality. Have you ever heard the saying, we are all one? Think about that. Think about where claims come from. Each individual, each being, has a port of sensation, the five or more senses. That's how one navigates through the earth. I mean, on the earth, through these senses. If I was not sensing things, things would not exist. If I cease to exist, everything ceases to exist. I can't say that if I die, that the life goes on with you, because I don't know, I'm not here. I can only make a claim for myself. I can't make a claim for you that your life is gonna go on after I'm dead. That's an assumption. And that's a very uh, subtle nuance of correct sentence structure, the psychology of it. One may only make claims for oneself unless they have the consent of another claimant party to make a claim for them. So I can't make, if, I'm, if I die, I can't make a claim that you're still alive because I'm not you. So each individual has their own port of sensation and has their own biosphere, their own worlds that they create, maintain, whatever it is. You, you know, I'm not, I'm not making a claim for you here. I'm just using this analogy as an example. If you weren't hearing me right now, I wouldn't exist to you. This podcast would not exist if you were not hearing it right now. This phone wouldn't exist if I wasn't speaking into it or looking at it or sensing that it was here. It's a very subtle psychological element that many people miss for whatever reason. I think as a guess, it has to do with the way most of us were programmed in the school system. Programmed to assume and presume things over all else and also to accept authority without question. Especially accept authority from people who have uniforms on or wear some special kind of outfit that has become familiar and synonymous with an authority figure. There are instances and situations where authoritarianism is very effective and actually saves lives. And that would be, in particular, those individuals who go into the military and have to go to war and are out in the field and it's a life or death situation. If they don't follow orders, they can get other people killed. So therefore you have to follow orders, but 
you, as a soldier, have consented to be in that position. You've consented to go to war. Now, you may go to war with the correct volition that you're there to, for the safeguard of your family and your country. And that's your idea of why you're doing what you're doing. You're over in the Middle East or wherever killing people because you feel that you're safeguarding your family back in your homeland. Whether this is true or not remains to be seen. The important thing is your volition for doing what you're doing. Now what happens when you're done with your tour of duty and you're finished and you come back home? How many soldiers are able to live a peaceful life, void of stress and worry after they come back from having to deal with those types of things? Psychologically, I would say not very many. I would say that killing other beings has to exact a huge toll on one's psyche, especially if one learns that the reason that one was doing it is not correct. That the actual reason that one was over there killing people was because one corporation want, uh, desired another corporation's assets and sent you over there to take it by force, basically. That would mess with someone's, I know it would mess with my mind if, if that were me in that position but I've never been in that position, so I don't know. And I would never presume to know what's going on there. I just know that the volition is what's most important. And I have gotten to know some soldiers, uh, some guys from the army, some guys from the Marines, who now realize their whole reason for going in there was not correct that they were misled uh, through nascence. And now they're trying to, I guess, give back in a sense to balance things out by teaching ordinary individuals how to think in a military way, like how to survive on the land, how to uh, set up survival tactics and things like that in case something happens. And personally, I love stuff like that. Like I follow a lot of individuals out there who teach this stuff because I'm interested in learning it myself because I always feel like it's always good to have some extra tools in your back pocket that you can pull out at any time and use in any situation. Better to have it and not need it and to need it and not have it. And that's also the way I look at correct sentence structure. I, I had a guy that was commenting on my live feed the other day who said that they've been studying my channel for two years, and yet they had no clue how to use correct sentence structure. And so my thought is, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That individual has been spent two time periods of 365 days watching videos but not learning anything or maybe learning but not utilizing it and if you don't utilize something it gets dull and fades away basic so my question is to the individual was what has kept you from pulling the trigger on it and they couldn't answer so to bring it back to the empathy part of it, I empathize with individuals like this. And my guess was that the reason why most people who say they want to learn this grammar don't learn it or don't commit to it is because they don't have a reason to. They've not yet hit a spot in their lives where they would need something as powerful as this. And that's great. Because that means that they already have tools in place that are protecting them. They already have tools in place that 
are enabling them to hold a position and to safeguard themselves and their families. Correct sentence structure is so potent that, as I've said in the past, and Colin David Ivan Wayne Colin Miller has also said, you know, it's like using a wrecking ball to swat a fly. And I've said it's almost like using a nuclear bomb to swat a fly. It's really that potent. And not everybody, you know, maybe some people are afraid of it. I don't know. Some people think it's too complicated, which it's not. It's very simple. It's super simple, which is what attracted me to it. I could sense that about it, even though it seemed very complicated to me at the time. But once it clicked, it clicked. And it's like riding a bike. It just never goes away. It's always there at your fingertips. As long as you remember the core basic rudimentary rules of the grammar and never deviate from them. There is no interpretation of it. Because once it comes into an interpretation, then it becomes fiction. There's quite enough of that around. I think that's why it's so effective is because so few people know it. Of course, if more people knew it, it would be more powerful, but I don't ever really see that happening. It's always going to be a, you know, a certain select few who have a reason to learn it and have the motivation to learn it. They have the volition to invest the value, the time, the effort, in going through those trials by fire, learning it, spending those hours with workshops or studying videos or whatever. Those are the people that will learn it. And even the majority of them, I have found, will get to a certain point and just stop. Mostly in these situations, it's because of a cognitive dissonance that happens. And this happens a lot of times with people who are, and I'm going to preface this by saying I don't mean to offend anyone, but this is what I've found. I'm not, okay, erase that last part. I'm not saying this. My volition is not to offend or harm anyone by what I'm about to say. My volition is to state the facts of my perception of what I experienced in teaching this for going on five years now. In that, the people who make it so far almost get closure on the grammar but drop off is because they suffer, they undergo a cognitive dissonance challenge, meaning they hold on to a cling, clinging to beliefs of religion or aliens or a galactic federation or there's some sort of belief that they cannot certify, which would then be um, confirmed as, a, as an assumption. They hold on to an assumption as a fact, something they cannot prove. And so therefore, it creates a dichotomy and a resistance. They cannot learn the grammar and get closure on it because gram the correct sentence structure is about the facts and positioning one's claims as facts. Whereas on the other side of that, they have this belief system about aliens or God or whatever it is that they can't certify. And so it creates a cognitive dissonance and they would just rather not finish or hold on to their belief of an assumption as a fact rather than voiding the assumptions and learning, finishing and concluding their study of, the, of how to position their claims as, in themselves as facts. I know that was a mouthful. I hope it made sense. But that's what I've found without fail. I've actually had uh, written contracts with people, helped them write contracts, who were, who did have uh, beliefs in God and things like that. And then I would have to basically grill them on it to the extent that they had to give me closure on what God was as a fact for them. Like, what is God? How can you certify that to me? Because two is certification. If you can't certify it to me, then I'm not going to be participating it with it as a fact, and I'm not going to be doing this contract. And although it's very you know few and far in between, I actually have one uh, individual who was able to do that. And that's the depth of closure that you need for any fact 
on your contracts. You have to be able to convey that closure to another individual, not only using adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, but also in correct sentence structure. I had another individual I was writing a contract for, and they wanted to make claims of uh, cosmic this or cosmic that, like locations in space and things like that, or even time travel. And so I had to grill them on that. How would you certify that? How, how would you certify that? And then I brought them to the closure of how to do that. And it is possible to do that. Everyone possesses the technique or the vessel with which to travel throughout the cosmos, which is just the same sea of space that we're in right now, or backwards and forwards through time, which is basically a location in the sea of space that we're in now, the continuum. But again, that's part of the psychology of the whole thing. And wow, I feel like I've really gotten off track. I started off wanting to talk about authoritarianism, correctness, autonomy, and empathy. And here I am talking about interstellar time travel. <laughs> I hope you found it entertaining. I hope that you subscribe to this podcast. You hit the thumbs up or whatever it is that you can do to uh, help the algorithms share it with uh, people that you might know who would find it interesting. And hey, if you want to do a correct sentence structure workshop, the way to apply is jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consult. The only thing it costs is your time and my time. Thanks for listening.